Section 11 of Astounding Stories, March 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories, March 1930. Vandals of the Stars by A. T. Locke. Part 2. A vague and shadowy figure was standing close by his side and peering down into his face. After a while, he realized that it was Steinholt. Steinholt, he gasped, why, why am I here in Fragoni's? I must have had a dream. And yet, he furrowed his brow in thought, and gradually he commenced to remember what had happened. It was no dream, said the scientist softly. Do you remember the trouble that you had with Zitlan? Yes, replied Dirk. I remember that he was insolent to Inga and that I lost my temper and struck him. But what happened to me? I don't recall that anybody hit me. I did hear sort of a peculiar sound just before I started to pass out, but... Teuxical took a shot at you, said Steinholt and you have been unconscious for over thirty-six hours. "'Took a shot at me!' exclaimed Dirk. "'What did he shoot me with?' "'That is what we all would like to know,' said Steinholt. "'He leveled one of those damn tubes at you and pressed the button on it. There was a hissing sound, a flash of light, and you got groggy and went out. "'He potted Zitlan, too,' continued Steinholt and he apologized for the trouble that his son was responsible for. Do you know, he added, I sort of like the old man. Lazar, with a sympathetic smile on his face, entered the room at that moment and overheard the conversation. Old man is right, he remarked, with a little note of awe in his voice. Teuxical admits that he is three thousand years old and that he has at least two thousand more ahead of him. That Lodor must be a queer world, he commented, shaking his grisly head. It is not so queer when you take everything into consideration, said Steinholt. It seems quite natural when Teuxical explains it. Lodor, it seems, is something like a hundred thousand times as big as this miniature world we live on. It took Lodor infinitely longer to solidify from a gaseous state than it took this world, and its entire evolution has been relatively slower than ours. Therefore, according to Teuxical, the people up there live longer, and incidentally know infinitely more than we do. What time is it now? asked Dirk after a moment of thought. It is just about twelve o'clock at night, Steinholt informed him. Have these Lodorians made any demands yet? Dirk asked. Does anybody know what they are going to do, or what they want? They are as liable to do almost anything, said Lazar, and it looks as though they will be able to get anything that they want. Teuxical, as I understand it, just gave you a slight shock with his death ray device. If he had pulled the trigger all the way, you would have become just a little pile of dust that the first breeze would have blown away. Our own death rays are somewhat similar, said Steinholt, but they are not a hundredth as powerful, and they won't work on the Lodorians either, he added, because those metal sheaths that they wear make them immune to all kinds of destructive rays. It appears, remarked Lazar morosely, as if this little world of ours is going to be taken for a ride, and it's too bad, considering that it's the only world we've got. There has been no formal presentation of demands yet, but it seems to be sort of understood that the earth is going to become a tributary of Lodor. It is a good thing, he added, that Teuxical and not Zitlan is the boss of that outfit. I don't like the looks of that young fellow. He's only twelve hundred years old, and he is sort of hot-blooded, I guess. 
I was talking with Antucan, said Steinholt, and he told me that the Lodorians usually make heavy levies on worlds which they discover and dominate. As soon as Teuxical returns to Lodor and announces a new discovery, a fleet of those damned monsters is sent out to mop up the new planet. That Malfero, who is the emperor of Lodor, is considerable of a monarch, and it seems that he has a passion for piling up wealth. Gold and platinum are as precious on Lodor as they are here, and he also likes pretty stones. And what is worse, added Steinholt, is his practice of enslaving entire populations and making toilers or warriors out of them. Those soldiers on the ship are not Lodorians. Millions of them were seized on some planet and converted into troops. It was a strange conversion, too, said Steinholt with a shudder. Their brains were operated on, and most of their faculties removed. They have no sense of fear, no consciences, no power of reasoning. They respond only to certain signals on a whistle, and their only definite and active impulse is that of murder and destruction. There is nothing to do, said Dirk positively, but to kill all of these interlopers, if we hope to save our world from being desolated. The three men looked at each other in silence for a moment, and then Dirk, somewhat weakly, rose into a sitting position in the bed which he had been occupying. But how, asked Steinholt, can we kill them? We might, of course, get rid of a few of them, but that simply would lead to our destruction by those who were left. There must be some way, asserted Dirk, and it is up to us to think of it without delay. If we let those Lodorians get a foothold on the world, all will be lost. The old man seems to be reasonable enough, said Lazar. He doesn't seem inclined to be destructive. We must not trust him or any of the others, said Dirk imperatively. We must rid the earth of every one of them, and the sooner we strike, the better. It had best be soon, if it is to be at all, said Steinholt. Fregoni has arranged to have Teuxical appear before the Congress, and the meeting has been called for tonight, when, I imagine, certain specific demands will be made upon us. We all will go to the Hague together on the ship of the Lodorians. And we leave? questioned Dirk. The meeting is set for 10 p.m. New York time, said Lazar. We will start east at about four o'clock in the morning, I guess, because it will only take a minute or so to arrive at our destination. Is Fregoni going? asked Dirk. Naturally, replied Lazar. And Inga? I believe so. Lazar told him. Fragoni was both afraid to take her and to leave her behind, but finally he decided that he wanted her with him in case of trouble. And are they, the Lodorians, still here? queried Dirk. Yes, responded Lazar. Teuxical returned to his ship last night with Zitlan and his other followers, but they came back late this afternoon, and they are still here. Zitlan seemed to be all right this afternoon, too. They must have used some means of bringing him out of the daze that he was in. We did everything we could to revive you, but none of our measures were effective. I'm all right now, asserted Dirk, as he finished attiring himself. I want to see Fregoni at once. We'll go out on the terrace, then, said Steinholt. They are all out there. Dirk, with his two companions, strolled out through the maze of rooms and corridors that led to the garden which hung so high above the city and the sound below it. The first thing that Dirk saw when he passed out into the terrace was the white tunic of Inga, who was leaning against a coping and talking with Zitlan. The latter was pointing skyward, and very apparently he was telling her of worlds which circled high among the stars. As if she were suddenly aware of his presence, Inga turned and saw Dirk, and he realized, by the expression on her face, that she was distraught 
and nervous. She came toward him quickly, after a few words to Zitlan, and the face of the latter darkened. There was hatred in his expression as he stared malevolently at Dirk. Steinholt and Lazar passed along and joined Fragoni and Teuxical, who were the center of a group that had formed in another part of the terrace. Oh, Dirk, said Inga, I am so afraid of that frightful Zitlan. He has been telling me again that he is going to take me back to his own world with him, and it makes me shudder to think of it. He is so strange and queer, and his eyes are so terrible. He can't be as young as he looks, because he speaks of years like we speak of minutes. I will die if I ever find myself in that monster's power. He has been telling me of all the creatures he has slain on the worlds on which he has landed, and I tell you, Dirk, that he is cruel and ruthless and horrible. He will never have you, swore Dirk, and if I hear of any more of his insolence, I will throw him headlong from this terrace. Please, Dirk, she begged, don't do anything, not yet. He is utterly unscrupulous, Dirk. He told me that even now he is plotting against some Malfero who rules Lodor like a god, and that he is planning to seize the throne of the planet. He wants to make me the queen of that fearful world when he becomes king. He boasted that if I were on the throne, millions of people from other worlds would be sacrificed in my honor in the temples of Lodor. Her voice trembled, and her eyes were terror-stricken as she continued. They tear out the hearts of living victims, she whispered, and burn them on their high and mammoth pyramids. Rage took possession of Dirk, and casting a glance at Zitlan, he saw that the Lodorian was smiling insolently at him. I'll kill that beast if it's the last thing that I do he exclaimed to Inga. Dirk, Dirk, she implored, don't even look at him. He is proud and impetuous, and he will kill you in defiance of his own father. We will find some way to rid the world of the scourge that has descended upon it, asserted Dirk confidently, and he will die with the rest of that monstrous crew. I am going in, Dirk, Inga said. Please, she begged, don't do anything rash. If something should happen to you, I would lose all the hope that I have, and I would, I think, kill myself. Don't lose hope, my dear, said Dirk reassuringly. I believe that I know of a way to destroy the plague that menaces us. He pressed her hand, and after she left him, he walked over and joined the other men on the terrace. Zitlan, coming from the terrace wall, stretched out in a chair not far from Dirk. Teuxical regarded the latter with a countenance that was calm and amicable. "'I am sorry, my young friend,' he apologized, "'that I had to intervene between you and my son.' He paused a moment and sat in silence, a thoughtful expression on his face. "'Ah,' he then said, "'what disasters have arisen?' out of the desire of men for women. In my wanderings over the starlit worlds, I have seen... He ceased speaking, brooded for a moment, and then shook his head slowly. But you cannot say that I was not just, he continued, addressing Dirk. I punished Zitlan for his presumption. Fragoni tells me that the woman has pledged herself to you. Let her pledge be kept he exclaimed sternly, looking straight at Zitlan. "'We are the conquerors,' asserted the latter boldly, "'and to us should belong the spoils of our daring.' "'Silence!' thundered Teuxical. "'My own son, above all others, shall be obedient to my commands, "'or like others have done, he shall die because of insubordination.' Zitlan, a defiant expression on his face, ceased to speak, but Dirk could see that he was livid with suppressed rage. As I was saying, Teuxical remarked, turning to Fragoni, I am getting old, 
and long have I been weary of conquest. I have seen your world, and it pleases me. It is a tiny and peaceful place, far removed from the strife and turbulence of the restless centers of the universe. So it is my will to leave you unscathed and return to Lodor for a brief time, to ask of the mighty Malfero the grant of this little provincial land, and then, with his permission, I will return here and rule it with wisdom and benevolence. I will bring to you much knowledge, and peace will be to the people of this earth, and peace will be to me. It is well, replied Fregoni. No world, I am certain, could hope for a wiser and more just ruler than yourself, and our Congress surely will receive you with acclaim. Teuxical bowed in recognition of the compliment, and his countenance indicated that he was gratified. We will go now back to our vessel, he said, addressing the other Lodorians. We will return for you at the appointed hour and conduct you to our ship, he added, speaking to Fregoni. We will be ready, Fregoni replied. Zitlan had arisen with the rest of them, and Dirk, with a look of contempt and amusement in his eyes, regarded him casually. May I have the honor of conducting our guests back to their ship in a plane? Stanton requested of Fregoni. The latter nodded, and Stanton walked across the terrace in the direction of the landing stage. Zitlan, as he followed after the others, passed close to Dirk, and pausing for a moment, fixed his hateful eyes on him. You dog, he whispered malignantly. Remember what I tell you. The time will come when I will cast you to the Carnaflocti in the dark, in icy caverns of sunless Tiganda. You will die, he swore, the death of a million agonies. For a moment, Dirk felt an almost irresistible impulse to hurl himself on the Lodorian and slay him. He managed to maintain his control, however, and only regarded Zitlan with disdain as the latter turned and went on his way. In another moment, the plane, containing Stanton and the Lodorians, was high up in the darkness. Dirk glanced at the great clock that gleamed atop of the beacon tower on the Metropole landing field. The hour was close to 12.30 a.m. A moment of silence on the terrace followed the departure of the plane that bore the Lodorians back to their craft. For an hour, the clouds had been gathering in the sky, and now a fine, cold rain commenced to fall. A peal of thunder echoed above them after a sharp flash of lightning had streaked across the black night above them. A servant appeared from the entrance to the apartment and pressed a button close to the door. Protective plates of glass noiselessly enveloped the terrace, sheltering those upon it from the inclement weather. It is well, remarked Fregoni, breaking the silence, that we were found by a leader like Teuxical. Our tribute will not be unbearable, and he will bestow many benefits upon us. But surely, protested Dirk, you do not intend to surrender without a struggle. Nothing but disaster, he asserted earnestly, will come upon the earth if you do. Teuxical may be honest and just, but, after all, he neither is immortal nor all-powerful, and something may happen to him at any moment, and there are those like Zitlan who would turn the world over to ravage and rape, and then convert it into a blazing pyre if they had their way. These vandals, he insisted, must be slain one and all, or, mark my words, our world will be laid waste. Dirk spoke with such a sense of conviction that his words held his listeners spellbound. Who is Teuxical? he asked, but the vassal of a monarch whose corsairs very apparently are carrying on a war of conquest in the universe. It will be disastrous, I say, to place any dependence in the goodwill of this one Lodorian. 
if he or any of his men return to that far-off planet where they dwell, word will be carried there of the existence of our world. But who can say that Teuxical ever will return here again? It may be the whim of his ruler to refuse his request, or any one of a thousand other events might arise to thwart his desire to live among us. No, concluded Dirk passionately, it never will do to let that great engine of destruction rise into the skies again. He is right, asserted Steinholt positively. It will be far better to annihilate these raiders if such a thing can be accomplished. Lazar was rather inclined to take sides with Fragoni. But how, he demanded, can such destruction be brought about? We know nothing of the capabilities of that monster that is lying down there in the sound. It is undoubtedly equipped with the deadliest of devices, and they all will be turned upon us if we fail in an effort to destroy the thing and those who have come from space upon it. If there was a way to smite them suddenly, to bring death to the Lodorians and to those swarming, mindless, murderous minions who act in obedience to them, I would favor doing it. But as it is, he concluded, it seems like inviting disaster even to think of such an attempt, much less to try it. It can be done, though, asserted Dirk, or there is at least a fighting chance of accomplishing it. The electro tent, he paused, and looked questioningly at Steinholt. The top of that monster is open, and the Teuton furrowed his brow and considered the proposition for a moment. Yes, he said, nodding his head. It might be done. Again he silently gave the subject his thought. It is well worth trying, he asserted with an air of decision. But we will have to make haste, he warned, if the thing is to be done before the flight to the Hague. So be it, said Fragoni. We will apply ourselves to the task at hand. I, too, he confessed, had rather see these vandals destroyed like so much vermin rather than have them carry the news of the existence of this earth back into those strange worlds in the depth of space. I will only regret the passing of Teuxical, who could have taught us much wisdom. And now, he continued briskly, I will place myself under your orders, Dirk. You are the one who suggested this plan, and upon you will fall the responsibility of executing it. And if it succeeds, he added, the glory will be yours. I care little for the glory, replied Dirk, but I gladly accept the duties and the responsibilities. These, he said to Fragoni, are my instructions to you. Inasmuch as Teuxical and his captains will return here at about four o'clock in the morning to convey us back to their craft, it will be necessary to have this building emptied of its inhabitants by that time. Let all of those who dwell here depart from it a few at a time, so as not to excite suspicion. Inga, above all others, must leave and retreat to a place of safety. Then, as the hour approaches for the arrival of the Lodorians, we will escape by plane from one of the rear terraces. They will land in search of us, and, well, then they will feel the force of our power. I will follow your orders explicitly, promised Fragoni. I wonder, he added, where Stanton is. He should be advised of what we are going to attempt. He will return in due time, replied Dirk, and if not, it will be the worse for him. Lazar will remain here with you, he then told Fragoni, and Steinholt and I will now go about our part of the task at hand. Dirk, followed by Steinholt, hurried across the terrace, and leaving the shelter of its quartzite plates, sought the landing stage. The rain still was falling, and the heavens were congested with dark and heavy clouds. Dirk, selecting one of the smaller planes, entered the cabin, and Steinholt, following after him, closed the door and threw on the lights. Swiftly they shot straight up into the air. 
Dirk, ignoring all of the rules of flight in his haste to be under way. Once in the westbound lane, he headed his plane toward Manhattan and threw his rheostat wide open. In a few minutes, they were skimming over the great city and past the 3,000-foot steel tower of the worldwide broadcasting station. For 15 minutes more, he kept the plane on a straight course, and then, bringing it to a quick stop, he let it drop like a plummet toward the earth. It landed, among many other planes, on the transparent, quartzite roof of a vast building, and looking down into the interior, they could see several rows of great dynamos. Some of them were turning, and the humming that they made could be heard plainly. Dirk and Steinholt ran rapidly across the roof until they came to a superstructure which they entered. There was a shaft inside. Dirk pressed a button, and an elevator shot up and stopped at the door, which automatically flashed open. He closed it after he and his companion had entered the cage, and dropping rapidly downward, they came to a stop in a lighted chamber that was far below the surface of the ground. A stoop-shouldered old man greeted them, an expression of surprise on his face. Gentlemen, he exclaimed, what is power, Gable? commanded Steinholt tensely. Power, let every dynamo run its swiftest. Tonight we have to use for the electroseotan. But I thought it was peace that those from the stars desired, said the old electrician. Through my radio visor I heard. That was sent out, explained Steinholt, to relieve the fears of the people and to keep them in order. Swiftly the distorted figure of the old man sped to a great switchboard, where he pressed button after button. The very ground commenced to vibrate around them, and the massive structure seemed to be alive with straining power. Then Steinholt, going to a corner of the intricate board, adjusted a few levers, while his gnome-like companion watched him carefully. And now, Gable, the scientist said impressively, these are your orders. At precisely the hour of four o'clock in the morning, make one connection with this switch. He indicated with a stubby finger the lever to be operated. Keep the circuit closed for just four seconds, he added slowly, and then break it. Do you understand, Gable? he demanded. I do, replied the old man. Then, continued Steinholt, after you break that connection, you quickly will close this next circuit. Keep it closed for four seconds, and then, after opening it for one second, close it again for four seconds. Repeat the procedure twice more, Gable, after that, and then await my further instructions. Is everything clear? he asked. It is, sir, the old man replied. I will follow your orders implicitly. There is one thing more, Steinholt said. Get the worldwide tower on the televisor and warn them of what is to happen. I will do that immediately, Gable replied. Dirk and Steinholt shot up to the roof again, and the building over which they walked seemed to be quivering with life. They could see that all of the mammoth dynamos beneath them were revolving, and the humming which they had heard before had changed into an ugly, vibrant roar. Again they took flight, and, reaching Manhattan, they continued north and east to the shore of Long Island Sound, long before the old East River had been filled in, and the space which it had occupied reclaimed for building purposes. All indications of its former bed had been obliterated by mammoth terraced structures. When they reached their destination on the shore of the Sound, a small submarine, which Dirk had ordered by radio, was awaiting them. Submerge and proceed up the Sound, Dirk ordered the officer, and take us directly under the craft of the Lodorians. In a few minutes they were skimming over the surface of the water, and, when a sufficient depth had been gained, the tiny boat disappeared beneath the rain-rippled sea. 
Dirk sat at a port and watched the aquatic life as it was illuminated by the powerful aquamarine searchlights. Progress under the water was comparatively slow, as mankind had made but little progress in underwater navigation. Airliners long before had almost superseded travel by land and sea, and the abolition of warfare had swept all of the old navies from the ocean. It was more than an hour before the officer in charge of the boat announced that the mammoth hull of the monster that was lying on the sound was visible directly above them. Both Dirk and Steinholt donned diving apparatus, and the former carefully adjusted the mechanism that was contained in a metallic box about two feet square. Then they stepped up into a chamber in the conning tower of the boat, and after a door slipped shut beneath them, water slowly commenced to pour into the compartment. When it was full, a sliding door that was in front of them slowly opened, and they passed out onto the deck of the underwater craft. Steinholt had been provided with some welding apparatus, and in a few minutes the box which Dirk had carried was attached securely to the bottom of the craft of the Lodorians. They then re-entered the submarine by reversing the process which had attended their exit. Very soon they were in the cabin of the boat again. If everything goes well, said Dirk, those damned Lodorians will never know what struck them. I only hope, said Steinholt, that we don't destroy that leviathan altogether. We might solve the secret of it, and then we too could ride out into the heart of the universe. It is impossible to imagine what will happen, Dirk replied, until after we launch our attack. Both of the men were silent during the return trip of the small undersea craft, which emerged at its dock a little before 3.30 in the morning. We'll have to hurry, urged Dirk nervously, because we will need a little time to make preparations after we get back the Fragonis. They entered their plane, and Dirk shot it swiftly up into the night, following the red shaft of light that rose almost directly from the point at which they had made their landing. Then, having reached the eastbound level, he headed straight in the direction of the palace of Fragoni. Dirk cast a glance at the great city that lay far beneath him. High up into the heavens it tossed the fulgurant fires that betokened its wealth and power. And down among those myriad lights, millions and millions of people were restless under the danger that menaced them. It was only a matter of moments now before their fate and the fate of their great metropolis would be decided. By dawn they would be free forever from the threat of subjugation and slavery, or else they, and all that they had toiled and striven for, would be the various dust of dying embers. And whatever befell them, likewise would befall the rest of the world, and every living thing that moved upon it. Dirk was high above Fragonis when he stopped the forward flight of the plane, and dropping it rapidly through the misty night, brought up easily on the landing stage. The other planes which had been there when he and Steinholt had taken their departure were gone, and Dirk felt a sense of relief when he observed this. Inga, then, must have departed with the other occupants of the colossal structure. Things were going according to the plan that he had conceived. He stepped out of the cabin, followed by Steinholt, and proceeded hastily along the terrace and turned the corner into the garden. Then he came to an abrupt halt, because there, before him, was Zitlan, with one of the deadly ray tubes of the Lodorians in his hand. Dirk knew immediately that something unexpected had happened, and that he was in the power of one who not only hated him, but who had an unholy desire for Inga. He realized, too, that any show of resistance would be nothing short of suicide, for he was well aware of the deadliness of the strange weapon with which he and Steinholt were being menaced by the gloating Lodorian. One false move, and you die, warned Zitlan. Come forward now 
and join those two others, over whom Antucan and Huazabar are watching. Dirk and Steinholt promptly obeyed the command of Zitlan, and walked over to where Fragoni and Lazar were being guarded by two of the conquerors. The rain had ceased to fall, but the skies were dark and overcast with heavy clouds. There was an occasional flash of lightning, and thunder rolled and echoed through the night. The terrace, however, was brightly illuminated, and every detail of the scene around him was visible to Dirk. He saw Stanton on another part of the terrace, standing among some Lodorians he had not seen before. Stanton, apparently, was not being treated as a prisoner, and Dirk wondered, rather vaguely, why this was. "'What happened?' Dirk asked Fragoni quietly. "'According to what I have heard,' the latter replied, "'Zitlan murdered his father in a fit of rage, and has taken over the command of the ship. Many of the Lodorians are his adherents, and even those who do not favor him are so terrified that they will be obedient to his wishes. And Inga? questioned Dirk. She is inside the apartment, said Fragoni, a note of desperation in his voice. Zitlan surprised us completely, and he and his men had us covered before we realized that Teuxical was not among them. Zitlan, in the meantime, had entered the suite of Fragoni, and he now came out, Inga walking before him. She was silent and proudly erect, but there was a pallor in her face that indicated her realization of the danger that she was threatened with. When Dirk saw her, she gave him a brave smile, which he answered with a glance of reassurance. He could see the great clock in the Metropole Tower, and he noticed with a feeling of grave apprehension that it was twenty minutes to four o'clock. There were only a few minutes more in which to make a desperate and apparently a hopeless effort to save Inga, his friends, and himself from a catastrophe which he had been instrumental in contriving. Then Zitlan stood before him, haughty and arrogant, his lowering countenance ugly with hatred. So, dog, he said, you who dare to defy Zitlan now stand before him a captive. Neither Dirk nor any one of the three others who were guarded with him replied to the utterance. You and that woman of yours, continued the Lodorian insolently, both are my prisoners to do with as I please. Your fate, he continued, I already have planned for you, and I assure you that it will not be as pleasurable as the one to which she is destined. You will find that Tigana, on which you and those with you will be cast, is a world of terror such as you never could dream of. Even the monsters which crawl through the deliriums of the mind are not as horrible as those which infest the mad and haunted world of which I speak. He paused a moment, a cruel smile on his face, as if he wished the full import of his words to sear themselves into the minds of the doomed men. But the woman, he added, will return to Lodor with me and be the queen of all women. And soon, he said savagely, she may be queen of all Lodor, of the worlds which pay tribute to Lodor, and of other worlds which I will conquer and ravage. My father stood in my way, and he died at my own hands. So will others perish, who thwart my ambition, and I will become supreme in the universe. A feeling of reckless fury possessed Dirk, as he listened to the words of Zitlan, and he felt an almost irresistible desire to drive a fist square between the mad, glittering eyes of the Lodorian. He glanced at the great clock, however, and he saw that the time to act had not yet come. At the last moment, he would make one desperate attempt to frustrate the evil designs of Zitlan. If it failed, well, all would be lost, but it was a far better thing to die resisting 
the despicable Zitlan and his minions than it would be to live and to know that, without a struggle, he had abandoned to degradation the girl he loved. This world of yours will be my world, he heard Zitlan boast, and the spoils from it will add to my riches. This one here, he continued, indicating Stanton, has offered to show me where all of the treasures of the earth may be found, and, as a reward, he will return to Lodor with me, and there be elevated to a high position. That, then, was why Stanton was not under guard like the rest of them. Our good friend Stanton, said Lazar, seemed to have become something of a Judas, and let his name be forever cursed, like the name of Judas, said Dirk. Silence, thundered the Lodorian. I, Zitlan, am speaking, he paused a moment, when I garner up the treasures of this world, in the way of precious stones and metals, I also shall gather more priceless loot, in the way of women, and then, having taken all that I desire, I will lay waste to this earth, so that those who survive will fear the name of Zitlan, and will grovel before him like a god, when once again he appears to them. While Zitlan had been speaking, Dirk had been studying the opponents with whom he soon had to clash. The two Lodorians who were standing guard over himself and his companions were close to his left side. Zitlan was directly in front of him, and there were seven of his minions clustered behind him. Again, Dirk glanced at the great dial of the clock, and he saw that it was seven minutes of four. The moment had come to act, if action was to prove of any avail. I will, but the words of Zitlan were interrupted by Dirk, who suddenly made a mighty sweep with his left arm, and knocked the deadly tubes from the hands of Anchukan and Wazabar. Startled by the assault, they went reeling backward. At almost the same instant, Dirk leaped forward, and, seizing Zitlan, hurled him among those Lodorians who had been massed behind him. Then he threw himself violently into the tangled mass, his fists driving in and out with deadly strength. Out of the corner of one eye he saw Inga pass the melee and dart swiftly to the corner of the terrace. Instead of passing around to the landing stage, however, she lingered there and watched the combat. Dirk, as he fought, became conscious that Steinholt and Fregoni were at his side, battling with him against his enemies. He saw, too, that Stanton had retired to the far end of the terrace, and that he was watching the struggle with frightened eyes. "'We must reach the plane and get away,' gasped Dirk, in another three minutes. He felled a Lodorian who, having lost his tube, was about to grapple with him. He saw Steinholt send another one of their opponents reeling backward. Fregoni, he exclaimed, the plane, get in with Inga, we will come. Even as he spoke, his fists were flailing back and forth between each one of his staccato commands. He saw beneath him a hand reaching toward a tube, and he kicked the instrument of death. It hurtled over in the direction of Stanton and landed close to his feet. Stanton might have picked it up and been in possession of the means of aiding his old friends or his new allies, but he shrunk away, panic-stricken, from the thing that lay so close to his reach. A Lodorian leaped upon Dirk's back in an effort to bring him to the ground, but he stooped swiftly forward, and his assailant was catapulted over his head into those who were in front of him. He caught a flash of the contorted face of Zitlan, flying through the air, and saw him land with a crash on the terrace, and lie there, writhing in pain. Steinholt, Lazar, he said convulsively, we've got to strike once more, and then run. He plunged into their enemies with every bit of energy that he had left, and saw two of them toppling down. Then, like a flash, he turned to Lazar, who was trying to fight off three of the Lodorians. Seizing one of them by the waist, Dirk hurled him backward, 
and he disposed of another one in the same manner. His sheer desperation seemed to have given him unbounded strength and power. Lazar sent his third opponent down with a blow under the chin, and then, with Dirk at his side, they turned to the assistance of Steinholt. With one mad rush they crashed into a group of Lodorians and sent them reeling away like so many ninepins. Now to the plain, exclaimed Dirk, taking to his heels across the terrace. Steinholt and Lazar followed after him, and, turning the corner, they saw that the ship was in place and that Fragoni was anxiously waiting by the door of the cabin. Inga, Dirk knew, already was inside and safe. He stood aside while Steinholt and Lazar leaped in. During the momentary wait, he caught a glimpse of the great clock. It was one minute to four. Dirk, jumping into the plane, and switched on the helicopter, without even waiting to close the cabin door. The ship shot skyward like a rocket. When it reached an altitude of 3,500 feet, he turned it north and raced at top speed in that direction. It was miles away from the Palace of Fragoni in less than 30 seconds. Dirk then stopped the plane and held it poised in the air with the helicopter. The skies were turgid and black, and the massed clouds, reflecting the lights of the great city below them, were permeated with an ugly, feverish red glow. From where they were hanging in mid-air, the occupants of the plane could plainly see the sparkling palace of Fragoni towering high up into the darkness of the night. The lights of the magnificent mansion were reflected far out into the sound, where, looming in the golden ripples, lay the sinister monster from the terrible depths of unfathomable space. Dirk took a watch from his pocket, and, after glancing at it, he hastily replaced it. Two seconds more, he said, and a sharp and dazzling bolt of greenish fire came hurling suddenly out of the west, and with a thunderous concussion seemed to fasten itself on the crest of Fragoni's palace. It trembled and quivered, as if endowed with some uncanny life and power, as it remained there against the darkness, throwing a weird green tinge over the water and up into the skies. Blue waves of light could be seen pulsing and racing along the terrible beam, and there, where it had fastened itself, they seemed to disappear in the vast and crumbling structure. For four seconds that destructive streak of light, one end of which was lost back in the mists that concealed Manhattan, tore at the proud pile. And as the stone crumbled and the steelite fused under the mighty assault, an ominous roar swept through the night. The air was so violently agitated that the plane, miles away, tossed up and down like a tiny boat on a stormy sea. Then suddenly the bolt was gone, but its livid image still burned in the eyes of those who had been watching it. Once more it came hurling out of the west, and, like the fang of some great and deadly serpent, darted into the monster that lay in the waters of the sound. Dirk and his companions could see plainly, by the light of the bolt itself, that it had crashed into the well from which the Lodorians first had appeared, and that it was beating and hammering its way into the very vitals of the craft. Dazzling, blinding fire seemed to pour from the aperture through which the bolt had passed. The clamor that arose was deafening. Then again the streak of fires was withdrawn, leaving the night intensely black, until, in a moment more, it came thundering out of the west again, and with an impact that made the land and the sea and the very heavens tremble, hurled its way into the depths of the doomed Leviathan. Twice again it fell, a fiery scimitar out of the darkness, and twice again it careened at the vitals of the stricken monster. Then, after the assault was over, the ship still floated on the surface of the sound, 
and its shell, as far as Dirk and the others could judge, still was unscathed. "'We will soon know our fate,' remarked Steinholt calmly. "'If that didn't kill those beasts, we might as well give up our ghosts.' "'I'll drop the plane a little lower and a little nearer to the ship,' said Dirk. "'I don't believe that any life is surviving in that thing.' "'My beautiful palace is nothing but dust,' sighed Fragoni, mournfully. "'And all my beautiful treasures, too.' "'And that beautiful Zitlan,' Lazar reminded him. "'And his beautiful boy friends. They are all dust, too, thank God.' "'It was a queer fate that Stanton met,' suggested Dirk. "'He thought that he would save his life by going over to our enemies, "'and instead of that he lost it.' "'Poor Stanton,' said Steinholt. "'He was born that way, I suppose, "'and I, for one, am ready to forgive and forget him. "'And now,' continued the Teuton, "'I hope that we didn't do too much damage "'to that little boat of the Lodorians. "'If we could get just a little peep at the inside of it, "'we might learn the secret of its contrivance. "'And then, my friends,' We could do a little journeying ourselves. Have you any theory regarding it? asked Fragoni. Teuxical intimated that it rode the magnetic currents, which, of course, flow through all the suns and planets in the universe, replied Steinholt. We have been working along that line ourselves, of course, and it probably won't be very long anyway, before we have the solution of interplanetary travel. Those Lodorians would have solved it for us if it hadn't been for that artificial lightning, said Lazar. That's powerful stuff, Steinholt. Yes, with that three thousand foot worldwide tower to hurl it from, agreed Steinholt. We can get fair range with it. If the Lodorians hadn't left the well of their ship open, though, the lightning wouldn't have done us much good. I was afraid, too, for a time, that we might have trouble in welding that automatic wireless circuit box to the bottom of the ship. Dirk, in the meantime, had brought the plane down to within a half mile of the Leviathan, and he was holding it poised there. It seems to me, he said, after scrutinizing the monster for a couple of minutes, that it is moving in the water. It is, he exclaimed. Steinholt, look. Only a comparatively short time had elapsed since the last bolt of lightning had vanished back into the darkness. It is still rocking with the force of the shock that we gave it, asserted Steinholt. You would be rocking too if you had been tickled by a bolt like that one. It is rising, I tell you, said Dirk. The front end of it is slowly getting higher in the water. You're right, Dirk, said Fragoni, excitement straining his voice. Look, it just dropped back into the water. Then, as they watched, the movements of the Leviathan became more and more agitated, until it was churning up the waves around it like a wounded and agonized monster of the sea. Suddenly, the front end tilted upward, and the monster rose clear of the water. It shot straight up into the air at a speed so terrific that they could scarcely follow it. It's gone, gasped Fragoni. Those brainless, mindless automatons must have survived. No, remarked Steinholt thoughtfully. I don't believe that there is any life left on that thing. No one had closed the well when it rose, and it would mean death to go out into space with the ship in that condition. Then what made it go up? demanded Lazar. Can the damn thing run itself, Steinholt? I imagine, recalled the Teuton, that our bolts killed every living thing that was on the craft, but that, at the same time, they set the mechanism of the monster into action. Ah, uh, he moaned, 
but that is too bad. We could have learned much by an examination of the interior of that liner of the air. A cry from Inga startled them, and they saw that she was looking skyward with terror in her eyes. They followed her gaze, and there, streaking through the black clouds, they saw a long trail of white fire. "'It's that thing!' exclaimed Fragoni. "'I tell you that those upon it still live, and that they are about to wreak vengeance upon us.' "'No,' said Steinholt positively. "'You are wrong, Fragoni. What is happening may be almost as disastrous, though,' he admitted. That Leviathan is in its death agonies. It is a metal monster gone mad, and none can say what will happen before it expires. The place for us, asserted Dirk hurriedly, is in the worldwide tower. There we can keep track of what is transpiring and try to decide what to do. The others agreed with him, and seeking the westward level of flight, he sped the plane in the direction of the mammoth pyramid from which the news of the world was broadcast. They reached the vast structure in a few minutes, and after dropping the plane on a landing stage, they went into the operating room. Here they learned quickly that the craft of the Lodorians was doing incalculable damage, and that it was throwing the population of the world into an unprecedented panic. It was, apparently, following an erratic, uncertain orbit that took it far out into space and then back quite close to the surface of the earth again. It had passed through the very heart of Chicago within a few yards of the ground, and it had cut and burned a swathe more than a mile wide through the buildings of that metropolis. Other cities in America had felt the devastating effects of its irresistible and molten heat, and within a short time thousands of people had been slain by it. Time and again, from the terrace of the great tower, Dirk and his companions saw the skies above them light up as that terrible, blazing projectile, which, uncontrolled, went hurtling on its way through the night. For three hours it careened on its mad course, and hysteria reigned throughout the cities of the whole civilized world. But then a report came from a rocket liner that had left Berlin en route for San Francisco. Either a great meteor or that leviathan of the Ladorians just swept down past us in mid-Atlantic and plunged into the sea. Apparently it has exploded, for it has thrown a great column of water for miles up into the air. We are stopping and standing by, although the heat is intense and clouds of steam are rising from the sea. As the minutes passed by after the report from the rocket ship had been received, the disappearance from the sky of the flaming craft from space seemed to confirm the belief that it had been swallowed by the ocean. This was accepted as a certainty by eight o'clock in the morning. Ah, uh, sighed Steinholt, if only it had crashed on land somewhere, if there only was enough of it left for us to— Enough of any damn contraption of that kind, swore Lazar fervently. It's altogether too much. I hope, for one, that its fragments are scattered so far that we never can put them together again. Dirk and Inga leaned against one of the parapets that evening on a gardened terrace of his own great mansion in Manhattan. Their little party had gone there after leaving the worldwide tower in the morning. After resting during the day, Lazar and Fragoni were somewhere together, discussing the plans for a new palace to take the place of the one that was destroyed, so that Zitlan and his minions might die in its ruins. Steinholt, elsewhere, was delving into oceanography and submarine engineering, in an attempt to learn whether or not it would be feasible to fish for the remains of the lost ship of Lodor. "'It seems like a dream, doesn't it, Dirk?' the girl remarked. "'It is difficult to believe that we actually have seen and talked with people from some faraway world.' 
Together they looked up into the crystalline skies, where mazes of shining stars gave testimony to the countless worlds which were wheeling around them. And just to think, Dirk, Inga continued proudly, that it was you who saved this world and all of its people from that horrible Zitlan and his horde. I saved you, he told her gravely and tenderly, and that somehow means more to me than saving all of this world and all of the other worlds which are rolling through the uncharted ways of time and space. End of Vandals of the Stars by A. T. Locke Part 2 End of Astounding Stories March 1930